Shown here is my first set of 32 pull-ups in one set. I want to talk about the training principles I used to achieve this and how I improved upon it. Of course, this took years of training, but if you're not structuring your training routine using evidence-based information, you will have a more difficult time achieving this feat. This video will not cover technique on how to do a pull-up, but rather concepts to use to structure your training for continual linear growth in maximal rep pull-up sets. But I will say I used the hybrid pull-up technique and I have linked information on that and everything else in the description box below. To start the discussion, as a beginner, any amount of consistent pull-up training will improve your reps and form. Once you've been training your pull-ups consistently for about one year, you want to start structuring your training to target specific goals. So speaking to the intermediate to advanced trainees, if your goal is to be able to do more reps, then you want to know these training concepts. When training pull-ups, you are likely training with just your body weight alone, which is effective at improving your overall pulling power and endurance. However, the most effective way to increase your single set maximum reps is to not only do body weight pull-ups, but also include weighted pull-ups and assisted pull-ups in your routine. First, let's set the groundwork for the following discussion. It's important to know that there are three metabolic energy pathways that power our muscles during exercise. All three energy systems are used during all forms of exercise, but the intensity and duration of the exercise will determine the percent of each pathway being used. First, the ATP-CP pathway, which stands for adenosine triphosphate, creatine phosphate, which is also referred to as the phosphagen system. This pathway is predominantly used in high-intensity exercise like weighted pull-ups or one-arm pull-ups, Olympic weightlifting, and the 100-meter sprint to provide maximal performance for about 10 to 15 seconds, and this type of exercise predominantly trains the type 2x fast-twitch muscle fibers. Next is anaerobic glycolysis, or the glycolytic pathway. Training in this energy system predominantly trains type 2a fast-twitch and type 2 X fast twitch muscle fibers as well. Blood glucose and stored muscle glycogen is the main fuel source. This system becomes the predominant energy production pathway after high intensity exercise, continues past 10 to 15 seconds, and can be sustained for two to three minutes, which is the main energy system used in body weight pull-ups when rep ranges are between 10 to 25, and also sports like wrestling and the two to 400 meter sprint. But the ATP production through the glycolytic pathway will decrease over that two to three minute period. And at about 50 to 60 seconds of sustained high output exercise, the next and last energy system will become the predominant pathway for energy production, the aerobic energy system, also known as mitochondrial respiration. This is the energy system being used during low intensity, long duration exercises like assisted pull-ups when intensity is significantly reduced and allows for high rep sets of 30 or more, and also marathon running or long distance swimming, or when the previous two energy systems have been exhausted. The aerobic system is slow at producing energy, but is the most efficient and can be sustained for long periods of time. This, unlike the two previous systems, uses fuel in the presence of oxygen. Some of the fuel used in the system are fatty acids inside the muscle and outside the muscle, like fatty acids in the blood and from fat tissues and muscle glycogen as well. When doing exercises, or in our case, assisted pull-ups at the intensity required for this energy system, the aerobic energy system, to predominate energy production, this would mean we are predominantly training type 1 slow twitch muscle fibers. Like previously mentioned, all three energy systems are used during all forms of exercise, but the intensity and duration of the exercise will determine the percent of each pathway being used. Training in a certain energy system, rep range and intensity will determine your fiber type training stimulus and therefore adaptations to your sport specific training. Knowing this means when doing a maximal set of pull-ups that goes until failure in the rep range of 30, you go through all three energy systems, which makes it quite a challenging feat to train for. You start by using stored ATP and the phosphagen system to produce the fuel your muscles need to perform the exercise that your body is demanding of it. This fuel through the phosphagen system will inevitably be exhausted in 10 to 15 seconds, which is when the glycolytic pathway dominates the energy production. And then in the last stretch of pull-ups, when fatigue is high and breathing rate increases, we're using aerobic energy production at this point to match the energy demands being requested. But to go through each energy system during a single set, you are likely outputting a lot of effort or going to failure, which can't be sustained over many sets and will lead to overtraining. Sets to failure or maximal effort intensity sets should only be done when you are primed for a personal best attempt. So we need to pick which energy system we are training for each session. And as mentioned, the best way to improve your pull-ups and to achieve high rep sets is to include weighted pull-ups and assisted pull-ups along with bodyweight pull-ups in your training routine. If you are only doing bodyweight pull-ups, then you are likely only training the phosphagen and glycolytic systems if you are training in the rep ranges of 10 to 25, which you will be when you're in the intermediate to advanced stages. So by only training with body weight, one is missing out on maximizing the benefits that can be realized from training both high intensity weighted pull-ups and low intensity assisted pull-ups, which are the two energy energy systems I want to focus on today. Training high weight, low rep strength ranges will confer great explosive power and will make doing pull-ups feel really easy. And this improves your early reps, but only to a certain point when the phosphagen system is depleted. For people who are just starting their pull-up progression,
progression journey, the pull-up is a strength exercise. However, as you're able to do more and more reps in one set, it becomes more and more of an endurance exercise. Going off the repetition continuum, rep ranges of 15 or greater start to favor endurance adaptations rather than strength. In other words, just because one can do a one-arm pull-up or a very heavy one-rep max weighted pull-up, it doesn't mean one can also do 30 or more consecutive reps. Training low-intensity high-rep pull-ups will confer endurance adaptations locally to the muscles involved with doing pull-ups, such as increased muscle mitochondrial and capillary density, which will improve your muscle's ability to produce energy and transport oxygen and nutrients to and from the muscle, delaying muscle fatigue. You should train each system to do high rep pull-up sets. By training all energy systems, you will never be a master of one, but being a specialist in weighted pull-ups or assisted pull-ups is not the goal when you're working towards high rep body weight pull-up sets. Instead, you need to train each energy system to be good in all areas, since doing high rep pull-up sets involves all three systems and there are benefits to training each one. To effectively train pull-ups in an endurance rep range, you may need to use bands or a pulley system to reduce your weight while doing pull-ups. Assistance bands will increase the total reps you are doing in each set, thus extending the time it takes to complete the set and reducing the intensity, resulting in endurance adaptations. According to the article, Loading Recommendations for Muscle Strength, Hypertrophy, and Local Endurance, a re-examination of the repetition continuum, a high repetition scheme with light loads, which is considered 15 plus repetitions per set with loads below 60% of one rep max, optimizes local muscular endurance improvements. And local muscular endurance, which is defined as the ability to resist fatigue when using sub-maximal resistance corresponding to 15 or more repetitions per set. Adaptations associated with such training have been attributed to an improved buffering and oxidative capacity, an increase in capillarization and mitochondrial density, and enhanced metabolic enzyme activity. Though, as the researchers point out, more research is still needed. It also goes on to state data suggesting a potential hypertrophic or muscle building benefit to combining not only strength hypertrophic, but also endurance loading rep ranges as part of a structured resistance training program. Let's take a look at how you would program your weighted pull-ups for strength. Low repetitions with heavy loads from one to five reps per set with 80 to 100% of one rep max optimizes strength gains. So for me, I weigh 174.2 pounds and my one rep max is 160 pounds for a total of 334.2 pounds because you were pulling your body weight too during a pull-up. This totals 334.2 pounds. Therefore, you multiply that number by 0.8, which gives me 267.36 pounds, which would give you 80% of your one rep max, then subtract your body weight to get the amount of additional weight you need to pull 80% of your one rep max. So for me, 267.36 minus my body weight of 174.2 pounds leaves me with 93 pounds. So for me, I need to add at least 93 pounds to work in an 80% or more strength range. Then of course, 100% of my one rep max is 160 pounds. So my strength training range is anywhere from 93 to 160 pounds. And I should be able to do somewhere between one to five reps in this range, depending on what percent my one rep max I'm pulling. And so because you include your body weight in addition to your one rep max added weight to find your total weight being pulled to determine what kind of percent weight you're pulling and what kind of rep ranges you'll be doing, this works for beginners too. So if you're only able to do one pull up and your body weight is 175 pounds, then you multiply your body weight 175 pounds by 0.8, which would give you 80% of your one rep max. And so for in that example, a strength rep range for somebody who can only do one pull up at a body weight of 175 pounds is anywhere from 140 pounds to 175 pounds. So for somebody who can only do one pull up for them to be training in a strength training range, they will actually need to subtract weight and use bands to do assisted pull ups to work on their strength development. Now let's find our endurance training pulling weight. Training endurance is typically between 40 to 60% of your one rep max, but I personally prefer training endurance for pull ups closer to 40% of one rep max due to the degree of difficulty involved with doing a pull up. So this is what I recommend. Again, I weigh 174.2 pounds and my one rep max is 160 pounds for a total of 334.2 pounds. You multiply this number by 0.4 or 40%, which gives me 133.7 pounds or 40% of my one rep max. This is how much weight I should be pulling to train endurance. You might be thinking this is less than how much you weigh. That is correct. This is where assistance bands come into play. You subtract 133.7 pounds, which is 40% of my one rep max from my body weight, 174.2 pounds to find out how much assistance I need, which is approximately 40 pounds. So by applying these bands, I subtract 51.4 pounds, lowering my pulling weight to 122.8 pounds, which is 37% of my one rep max at the bottom, because as I pull, these bands lose tension and their assistance decreases. Assisted pull-up training allows you to increase your volume and stimulate more of your type one muscle fibers. And this leads to a very effective forearm, bicep, and lat pump, which is one easy but not scientific way to tell you are stimulating the endurance adaptation. 
limitations after your set. You have to embrace the burn. As you become stronger and your endurance improves, working both of these energy systems, you need to increase your weight and or reps to continue to improve. Training in each system will help prevent burnout and overuse. Endurance work is very taxing due to the high repetitions required and the pain endured locally to the muscles from the hydrogen buildup, or in other words, the burning pump. Strength training uses heavy loads that can lead to joint pains over time without adequate recovery. And a hypertrophy range working in the glycolytic system is typically tolerated the best and what is usually trained by most people. Not only mixing up your routine, but also varying the intensity of each training session keeps training days more interesting and sustainable long-term. And you will get a compounded benefit from training each rep range and energy system, opposed to hammering the same rep range and energy system for weeks on end. But of course, implementing adequate recovery in your meso and macro cycles is very important for progression. An example of a two week micro cycle might be this here. Repeat two to three times and then deload. This is just an example of how you can follow a mixed energy system micro cycle. If you have a particular area of weakness, for example, your weighted pull up, then including more days of strength training might make the most sense. Or if you have a great weighted pull up, then include more endurance days to round out your pull up fitness and keep strength days as a maintenance in your routine. But everybody's different. Their ability to recover is different. The amount of work they can output in a single session is different. Life outside of training, consistency, and other stressors in your life will affect your training schedule and progression. It's best to train the same muscle group, in this case, the lats, biceps, and traps, which are all used in a pull up two to four times per week and four to six working sets per session. You want to be well recovered for each training session so that you can train at your best. Ideally, you wouldn't feel any fatigue at the beginning of a training session. However, depending where you're at in your mesocycle, you may likely feel some amount of fatigue before training. However, it shouldn't be so much that it greatly impacts your training session. Ideally, you would be fully recovered for your next training session so you get the most out of it. Not only how frequently you train will dictate how many recovery days you will need, but also how intense the training session is. You could train pull-ups every day if your session intensity is low enough, but that is not the best way to make meaningful progress over time because the daily stimulus would have to be so small to be recovered again for the next day. That's why in some training sessions, you should be pushing yourself at a high intensity and others you should be using moderate or even low intensity effort so that you don't overtrain, which will blunt your progress and lead to burnout. Also, make sure you're not expending too much effort towards other lifts if your primary goal is to get better at pull-ups. By training other movements or other muscle groups too intensely, you might negatively impact your pull-up training sessions, reducing your overall progress. However, you should still train other muscle groups, such as by having a push day, cardio day, doing yoga, core, or other accessory lifts that stimulate the shoulders and low back to round out your physical fitness. But the intensity of those sessions should not leave you so fatigued that you impact your upcoming pull-up training sessions, since this is your main goal. Your capacity for work will improve over time as your body adapts to the training stimulus it gets from your pull-up sessions. About every one to three sessions, you should try to increase the reps you are doing or increase the sets or weight to continue making progress. Remember that you should only go to failure when you are testing your max. Going to failure during your training sessions will cause more fatigue than you can effectively recover from before your next set and next training session, thus limiting your total training volume and slowing your progress or in some cases causing a decline in progress because the amount of fatigue that builds from a set to failure requires a lot of recovery. Also aim to deload every four to six weeks of training to prevent overtraining, burnout, declines in performance, and overuse injury. To easily understand the concepts discussed in this video, some days you should add weights to make your reps so challenging that your rep ranges are in that one to five rep ranges. Some days you should use assistance bands to increase your rep ranges until you get that muscular burn and that pump in addition to your body weight pull-ups. But whatever you choose to do, because each person is different in terms of their weaknesses and their strengths, it's important to stay consistent and know that improvements take time and adjust as needed because achieving a set of 30 or more pull-ups takes years of consistency and dedication. Just take it one day at a time and enjoy the process. Now go do some pull-ups.